In 2004, I attended an IPAM workshop uh, on multi-dimensional, multi-scale, something, remember? M Mike Wakin uh, was also there as grad students that we visited. And that was a pretty profound meeting, uh, definitely launched uh, at least my career in towards certain direction. So, um, you know, students that are here, I mean, uh, take notice. It's nice to see other disciplines and, you know, what, how other people think and present and learn a lot from that. So uh, that, that's, I, I'm truly grateful for that opportunity. So I'm happy to come now and uh, have you, you know, here as a speaker. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today, you know, for, for those who are familiar with some of the work that we've been doing, is mostly it was all compressive sensing, fast imaging. But I wanted to talk something completely different here. And it's something that I might say that may turn out into a new imaging modality somehow, or maybe a, a newish imaging modality, which I think has a lot of promise. So this work is primarily uh, the work of Suma Anand, who's a graduate student in my group. And then some of the work uh, that I'm going to show is from Nick Huntinger, who's a visiting um, student from, uh, from Utrecht that visited us. So a little bit about the gr uh, my group. My group looks at what we call a computational MRI, which is really the interaction between um, the physics, the hardware, the data, how you collect the data, how do you reconstruct images out of this data, all together and try to optimize that as a whole, holist in a holistic way, look at that as a whole system. So by doing this, if, if some of you are familiar with how MRI images kind of look like, well, they're usually very static. But once you add certain new acquisition, new reconstructions, you can create those videos of dynamics, like you see here, for example, how contrast may, may change, sorry, how contrast may change in the, in the body or, or dynamic imaging of contrast enhance, enhancement and so on and so forth. So uh, extremely powerful uh, things. And what we do is we look at all those aspects, optimize the hardware, the sequences, the acquisition, and the application. So I, I had to talk a little bit about MRI. This is a typical MRI scanner. Uh, you've got yourself a big magnet um, that is as high as three is sometimes seven Tesla. You have a subject that you put inside the, bo the bore, and then you uh, image their body. But imaging is what you image is really just hydrogen atoms within the body, and mostly coming from water. Now, if you look at, the, uh, at what, what you have here, uh, you could see that there is uh, a person here lying on the table that would be moved in inside the machine. There's also this uh, cage that you put your head inside. And those are actually receiver coils that receive radio frequency information that is really the NMR signal that's being picked up. So a lot of that we're going to talk. So just pay attention about these coils. Okay. All right. Um, now MRI is extremely versatile. What's amazing about this imaging modality is the it's just uh, so many, it's just sensitivity to, con to contrast. It's just unbelievable. So we have what a thing called pulse sequence. You change the software of how sequence of either radio frequency pulses or some electromagnets that are changing inside. You just change a few parameters in software and you get like completely different images. And you can turn on and off certain sensitivity to different parameters of tissue, for example, how tissue is more solid, less solid, more liquid, less liquid, and so on and so forth. There's just so many knobs that you can change. With CT, CT machines, uh, computer tomography, which are based on x-ray, you pretty much an operator can do like, uh, let's put more x-ray, let's put less x-ray. There's just not much to do there. But in MRI, there's just so many parameters you can change, and that's why also this modality has been going on for such a long time. These are all MR images. I mean, they represent lots of stuff. You can see kind of moving stuff of the heart and flow on the left. There's like functional activity of the brain on the right over there. Uh, there's uh, tractography where you can image, uh, you know, how neuron bundles are, you know, placed in your brain by looking at NMR signal from that. But you can really kind of separate into two things. One is more structural, like, you know, sensitive to structural, and the other one is functional where you see how things are operating and how well they're operating. Okay, so these are the two things that can be done with MRI. Now, while I'm not going to talk about MRI, I think it's important to understand a little bit the physics and how the signal is being picked up in order to understand what we're actually trying to do here, which will be motion sensing inside an MRI scanner. Okay, so 
what is, what, how does MRI work? Crash course, okay? Uh, signal comes mostly from hydrogen water, uh, mo uh, hydrogen atoms, mostly from water. You got a sample, let's say a glass of water that you put in a, inside a magnetic field, and that is being magnetized or polarized. Okay, so there is a magnetization that's being created. Uh, now, what you do is you apply this radio frequency pulse that excites this magnetization. I'm really talking, kind of waving my hands over here. But in turns, it's kind of like, ding! You know, it emits back a radio frequency at a particular, a radio frequency at a particular frequency that is proportional to the magnetic field. So your water uh, or the hydrogen, um, uh, I guess, nuclei of, of hydrogen atom, protons, they become pretty much magnetometer. They produce RF frequency that is proportional to the magnetic field that they see. If you increase the magnetic field, then also the frequency is going to increase proportionally. Okay, that's great. So what happens is we want to create an image. So we put now three glasses of water inside the MRI and we'd like to get some spatial information. But the problem is that when you have just this uniform, very uniform magnetic field, it's missing the spatial information. Um, you know, the analogy for that is, is really kind of like a uh, piano with just one, one bar. Like you excite and you just hear one tone. So that's a problem. But we'd like really to create a piano where you can play different tones and know actually where you pick, you know, where you keyed the, uh, you know, a piano has frequency correspond to position, right, as you play them, right? Because we want to do something like this. In order to do that, we add what's called a gradient field. And the idea with a gradient field is that, uh, uh -oh, is that in the center of the scanner, it's unchanged. Like the, the field is, is the same. But on one, hand, one, one side of the scanner, it's a little bit stronger. On the other side of the scanner, it's a little bit weaker. What it does, it creates now a distribution of frequencies that each one of those glasses sees a slightly different magnetic field, so they'll emit a different frequencies once excited. Okay, so if we actually zoom in at what's going on here, you'll see that this is kind of, each one of those glasses will produce a different tone, and you'll see a different spectrum corresponding to the tones that also correspond to the position. And now, you've got spatial position uh, maps to frequency, so all you have to do, if this is the signal that you pick up in time, this is the time signal, this is the signal that we pick up from the MRI, all you have to do is uh, compute a Fourier transform, and then you would create an image of those glasses of water, in this case just one dimensional, uh, of where they're distributed in space. So you know that this one is a little bit to the left, this one on the right, and this one's further to the right. So this is a one-dimensional kind of MRI, but in order to do images, what you do is you change the orientation of this gradient field and you play those in various ways. Now, uh, now you're getting now into a regime where it looks more like a piano that each part of, the, uh, of your body that you put inside the scanner will play a different sound or RF frequency which you create, create an image. Okay, now you hear that? That, this is the sound of those electromagnets that are changing and creating the, those are the gradient fields that are switching on and off and in different direction that creates this, this uh, really beautiful sound that MRI makes. Um, I'm not going to ex explain to you how you go and extend those ideas for, to multidimensional, but I would say that the idea with MRI is that you actually collect data in the spatial, multidimensional spatial frequency of the object. It can be done either in two-dimension Fourier transform or a three-dimensional Fourier transform, but the raw data in MRI is really collecting line by line parts of the Fourier transform of this image. And it's done sequentially. Okay, so the data that you collect is done sequentially, and that's why MRI is also slow, because you have to collect line by line by line by line. As the more you collect, you get either a higher and a higher resolution that you can eventually achieve. Okay. So obviously there's a trade-off here between scan time and resolution and, uh, the, and, uh, and other things. So, but the whole idea right now, just so you understand, is that MRI is really a Fourier transform machine. We collect data in the Fourier domain. In order to reconstruct an image, we compute an inverse Fourier transform. Okay. Just for simplicity. 
But I would say that MRI is kind of similar to kind of early cameras. You know, it's, it's, it's very slow. This is, this is a, one of the earliest uh, photographs of a person in 1838. And you know what's, what's actually missing here? Like this is a picture of a street, midday, right? What it's missing is all this stuff. All these carriages and people moving around, and those are missing because this image was acquired over about 30 minutes to an hour okay, of exposure time. And so what's interesting here that this is actually an image of a person because if you stare out at the silhouette, you could see, oh, there is this person here. And the reason that this person was detected, or you can see something, because they got their shoe shine for about 15 minutes. And so they stayed still, and you'll be able then to uh, create an image of the silhouette. This is really what MRI is in the sense that you are required to stay still. Otherwise, you can't observe all the things that are going on. Okay? I have a question. In yeah. the, the early slide that you showed the dynamic is emotion. Yeah. Why, why you said that? <laughs> we'll get to that. Well, I mean, this, this is all fancy compressed sensing, deep learning, you know, multi-dimensional, low rankness, and all that stuff that have to be put in in order to be able to do that part of it. Um, so actually, that leads to kind of my point here that if you are in an MRI scanner and you collect data, this is kind of the images that eventually you're going to get. But now this is a situation where you inject contrast into the body, and there's a lot of dynamics. I mean, the, where's the heart? The heart's supposed to be moving. The, the patient's supposed to be breathing. But you don't see it because it takes so much time to collect it. Now, if you can go and do some ideas like compressive sensing, you know, acquire less data, use some redundancy in order to do the reconstruction, you can maybe capture the dynamic at a higher rate and then be able to resolve possibly its dynamic. But even then, still, it's not possible to resolve everything. For example, the heart beating here is problematic. It's not really what's happening. The resolution here is not perfect. You know, it's, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that you can still not recover. And so the question is, I mean, we have also external sensor that we can add. We can add cameras. We can put all sorts of other things inside an MRI. Can we leverage those into the reconstruction in order to improve upon what we can do? Okay. So we need some help in MRI. I mean, we're limited. Uh, SNR is limited. Acquisition time is limited. Yeah, we can use fancy modeling, but even that is limited. Okay. So how do you sense motion MRI? And here, uh, for those that are in the field, Please forgive me because I can, cannot cover everything that's been done. But there are some different ways to, that you can uh, uh, measure uh, motion. One are sequence independent where um, you know, they really don't, de don't depend on how you collect the data. For example, if you go bellows or you put ECG on, on yourself, you know, those will be se sequence independent. They don't really depend on the MRI signals. Uh, there's, there are those that are high accuracy and sensitivity. For example, you put a camera in front of a person's head, and then you track. You can track the motion, right? So at least rigid motion, you will be able to to collect. Um, and then, the thing is, we also imaging patients, and patients unfortunately are sick, and it's very uncomfortable to be sick. And so, you, MRI is not a comfortable uh, type of an examination. So you also want to make you know, provide a lot of more patient comfort. So there's a lot of these methods that are lying there. And what I'm going to focus here is the idea of using RF frequencies inside an MRI in order to estimate motion and then leverage that in order to get all sorts of um, information like respiratory, cardiac, and maybe translation, rotation, motion. This doesn't require anything to be put on the body. And it's just completely wireless, and that's, that has an advantage over it. So wires. I mean, I work a lot in pediatric imaging. My group is, focuses a lot on the, these applications. And you look at these children that have to go through an MRI, uh, then you have to connect them to all sorts of stuff. What do you connect them? Well, these are respiratory bellow to measure resp uh, respiratory motion. These are uh, ECG to uh, measure the heart. You got yourself also PPG and, or blood, blood ox on your finger in order to uh, measure blood oxygenation as well as, um, as, car as cardiac. And then there's other things like you know, pressure cuffs and you, know, you, you want to maybe them to see some movie or so on and so, so forth. And then you put the antenna that picks up the MRI signal damn, on the, on, the, uh, on, the, on the patient. And that actually puts a lot of you know, weight on them. So 
we've been working on that part, how to alleviate this, but I'm not going to talk about that. But they would be asleep, typically, right? Sometimes they're asleep. We try to actually avoid having them being sedated because anesthesia is actually uh, could be problematic, especially for children. So uh, you, I mentioned this antenna that you put in, on it, but that's really um, an important thing that you have to use in MRI. There's actually an array of receivers. You've got all these loops of coils that are, each one of them is resonant, resonant to the particular frequency that is used for MRI. At three Tesla, it would be around 127 or 123 megahertz. At 1.5 Tesla, it will be 63 megahertz. And seven Tesla is about 300 megahertz. And so these are LC resonant uh, circuits that you then go and connect them through transmission line to a preamplification. And af after preamplification, you digitize each one of those channels. And then you put, pass that into some reconstruction that will go and reconstruct images. You know, the fact that you use these arrays allows you, actually, each one of those loops is sensitive to different part of the body, allows you to speed up acquisition. It's not a Fourier transform anymore. It's a little bit slightly different. Uh, but also increases significantly the signal to noise ratio because it's really close to the body so you can pick up the signal better. Okay, so you jam that thing on, 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 a, uh, on a patient, but you know, that's, that's, that's the cost maybe for, for having really good image quality. Um, now, what I'm showing you here is actually an artifact. Okay, sometimes, you know, MRI are built inside a, um, a shielded room, and uh, sometimes you'll have hold in the, holes in the shield. And I don't know about you, I'm a, you know, 127 megahertz is actually within the airband. So airplanes transmitting in that frequencies, you can have, uh, you know, all sorts of processors emitting some other tones and stuff like this. So what happens if there's a leak of RF, you would get some uh, artifact, which looks, it's called a zipper artifact inside an MRI scanner, inside the image. This is an example picked up from the web. Okay, that is an artifact, undesired, okay? But it happens, okay? So why does it show up in the image? Well, the reason it shows up in the image is because, remember, those glasses of water or different places inside the MRI scanner are mapped to a particular frequency. So now if you have some leakage of RF energy somewhere inside the room, they'll pick up by those coils. Well, if it's within the bandwidth of your receiver, then it will show up as part of your digitization. And it will show up as a position uh, that depends on the frequency of that thing. So previously, that leakage actually appeared in the middle of the image, but sometimes you know it could appear on the side. So if I got a patient over here, actually the distribution of you know, frequencies that I'm gonna get are now more, con you know, more continuous, but I will get this interference that will show up in my image. That is usually undesired, okay? All right, so let's go back and think about what are, again, MRI coils. These are resonant circuits, okay? They're resonant, so that means that they're also very sensitive to a particular frequency. Now, what you try to do is you try to match them to 50 ohms, that, because most transmission line of 50 ohm preamps expects 50 ohms, but once you put an antenna close to the body, it actually couples to it. You're partly conductive. So the antenna becomes, you know, uh, your body becomes part of the antenna and actually introduce losses or extra impedance. And when your heart beats, well, that actually modulates the amount of blood that changes or even when you breathe, that modulates actually the impedance about plus minus 5%. That's not a huge thing for the MRI, okay? It's not a huge thing, but that's actually, it's something that can be, you know, that happens. Now, Imagine what happens if you have some of this RF interference. Now the RF interference that is being transmitted is also picked up by this coil, and then it will go through the same mechanism and be modulated because this now impedance changes, so also this RF that is picked up is going to be modulated by the heart beating. It's also going to be modulated by the breathing. So maybe we can take that idea of interference, which is not a good thing, a bug, into a feature by, being, uh, by seeing those modulations that occur and then be able to say, oh, wait, something happened. There was some motion that happened. The heartbeat, the breathing happened. Okay? 
This goes again to the preamp it being digitized. And so the whole thing that we need to make sure is that that artifact doesn't overlap with our image. If it's just on the side, we don't care. Okay, and that's the idea. So uh, wireless motion sensing, this actually idea is called pilot tone. You transmit uh, an off-resonance tone. So off-resonance means that a tone that's outside, uh, within, within your receiver bandwidth, but outside of the bandwidth of the image, because remember, position corresponds to frequency in MRI. So you transmit a tone that is a little bit off, shows up as a line. This is the same interference that I've seen before, uh, and the idea is that uh, this is being modulated then by the, uh, the, the motion of the body. Okay? That's, that is uh, developed by Siemens, they call it pilotone. And the thing is, if your MRI works at 127 megahertz, well, then your frequency of the stone has to be within 127 plus a little bit megahertz. Otherwise, it won't be received by your uh, receiver coils. All right, but this is still great. Here's an example of this type of motion sensing. This is the raw data that I showed you before. You just collect, keep on collecting those lines, and I showed only the real parts. You can kind of see this oscillation that's happening over here. If you compute a Fourier transform in the uh, horizontal direction, you see, oh, this is the NMR signal bandwidth, and here is the tone that shows up. In every line, you'll have a different tone. Now, while you breathe, this tone is being modulated and changed. Uh, over time, a little bit, 5%, not much. If I compute a Fourier transform in the Y direction now, well now I get an image, and now you can kind of see the breathing. This is a very low frame rate, about uh, uh, one image per second, but uh, we have about 256 of these lines every second that we collect. So maybe we can now capture the breathing motion at a much higher frequency. And in fact, if I actually plot this intensity of the line for each one of those receiver coils that I see, I can see that several of them are being modulated by this breathing motion. So you can capture that breathing at a much faster rate than the imaging, and so you can use that, for example, to gate or acquire only data during that time. So there's a lot of things that you can do in order to uh, be able to correct for that motion. So this is an incredible wireless respiratory motion system invented by Siemens Albit. Okay, so for pilot tone, you know, the source of modulation is really the coil loading. It's just these changes of impedance. It's about 5% of the signal change. But then think about it. What happened? I mean, this is, this is VHF. But what about higher frequency like microwaves? They interact with the body completely differently. They may actually have a smaller wavelength, so they can, you know, change quite more than. A, uh, a wavelength that is about two and a half meter long uh, would change. So the question that we were asking is, can we implement some microwave MIMO, multi-input, multi-output type of radar inside the scanner? Now we've got out multi-output because we're receiving with many, many coils that are different in space. But we can also put maybe even many transmitters. So then you can have a lot more information inside the bore. So what about 2.4 gigahertz, where, let's say, now the wavelength is much smaller? So, um, you know, here's the field distribution from an antenna on top. This is 127 megahertz. The field just decays. You know, it just decays as it goes down, and that's, that's pretty much it. But at 2.4 megahertz, then you got these standing wave patterns that are being created inside the bore. Now it's a lot more complex electromagnetic field patterns because now the wavelength is much smaller than the bore, so you got all these standing wave patterns that are being created. So now your signal is quite more complex than in this particular case. So I have to admit, um, Suma uh, was really interested in this pilot tone method, and I was just like, well, I mean, Siemens has a product on this. I mean, what can we do about it? But you know what? I mean. I've, I love being surprised, so okay, let's, let's just do it. And I love radio, so why not? Use radio inside MRI, that sounds cool. Let's try to re-implement um, what it's done. But then, the question really is, that, w that, that we're asking is, can we move out of this you know, low frequency? Can we move into this? And the idea is, well, we still want to use all these receivers that the MRI already have. We don't want to add more stuff you know, on the body. How can we use them? And the idea uh, was really to exploit 
some of the uh, receiver chain inside of the MRI that is slightly nonlinear. You've got this preamplifier there that is designed to be linear, but it's slightly nonlinear. And if you instead transmit two tones instead of one, and those two tones are separated by this frequency of 127.8 or 128 megahertz, then they will be intermodulated, and then uh, you know you generate effectively a uh, a frequency that is within the bandwidth of the MRI. And that idea was pretty pretty nifty. And so here's here's the notion: you instead of transmitting 127 megahertz, you transmit a 2.4 gigahertz and a 2.5278 gigahertz signal altogether. Now that's being picked up by the coil inefficiently, but it's still being picked up by the coil. And then goes through the preamp. Once it goes through the preamp, there is a little bit nonlinearity there, so it's intermodulated uh, and is creating a frequency which is actually within the receiver bandwidth that can then go be digitized and show up as an artifact in the image. And as long as we design it to be outside of the image, then we can use it for motion navigation. So. Any order, by the way, it can be second order, it can be third order intermodulation. So you can now have a lot of options of which frequency to pick and you know what bandwidth and so on and so forth. Okay. How do you generate this? It's actually quite easy. You have two transmitters, one transmitting F1, one F2. You power combine them, uh, you then amplify them. You high pass filters, you make sure you don't transmit 127, you only transmit the high frequencies. And then you send that into an antenna that is inside the bore. Okay? Now you can use all the hardware that the MRI has, but you know, see what happens in the microwave frequencies, which is, which is pretty nifty. Okay, so how do, you how do you process? You receive the raw data, you demodulate by that frequency, and then you can look at the magnitude for each coil. You, you do it separately for each one of those coils, or you can actually look even at the phase and you use one of those coils as a reference because phase is kind of arbitrary at MRI and you can kind of see those modulations that come up. And the whole idea is that we have, I don't know, 32. Today, systems have 32, 64, 128 receivers already built in for you to be able to receive this. So really, this is a large, uh, large number of receivers. Now, how can we guarantee that uh, this is, uh, what we're seeing is something different? Here's a motion phantom and you can kind of see this thing moving like breathing and the antenna up here, and you see about, I don't know, 50% modulation of the signal. That's pretty strong. This is, P this is pilot tone, that's 127 megahertz, about 2% modulation. And that's because the motion, uh, you know, the, the sensitivity to the signal is really dependent on those standing waves as opposed to this loading that, there's no loading here that really happens. Okay, so extremely more sensitive to breathing motion than just this pilot tone. So that's pretty exciting. Okay, so now if you simulate what's going on at different frequencies, you can kind of see, oh, you know, this is kind of a decaying field, this is another decaying field. At 100 megahertz, you start seeing kind of, oh, maybe starting, there's some standing wave patterns being created, but then 1.2 gigahertz, 1.8, 2.4, a lot more complex stuff going on inside. Think about how many changes can happen when somebody is moving. Now, this is without a patient in. But if you put a subject in, it creates new uh, boundary conditions. And anything that changes will change that field significantly. So then you can become more sensitive to motion, which is, can be good and can be not so good, depending on what you're trying to do. Mickey, uh, can you go back there? Just yeah. So I'm just looking at the, the phases. Yeah. Uh, this is an object, so it's a dielectric. So that's a person, kind of simulating a person. Okay. So the uh, uh, the speed of light inside a person is is you know is, is slower. For sure. Okay. So, so that that's the. Yeah, that's the kind of person inside. Yeah. So the phases changes more rapidly inside a people inside people, which is quite interesting. Um, now here's kind of what we think about the expected you know, beat pilot tone, we call it beat pilot tone because we transmit a beat frequency uh, signal response. This is, let's say we have this type of E-field distribution and let's say your coil is moving inside and sampling that distribution. Now, it could be that or it could be that the field is moving because of breathing and it could be that it's changing, but let's say that this is kind of the field distribution that we have, this is high, this is low, uh, and that's another peak. And so if you have, you know, a coil that's moving or the field is moving in this particular way, your BPT signal is gonna show, oh, this is increasing and then reducing. 
okay? Because you're going over a peak and then come, you know, going back. And so we did this experiment where we put like this array and then we move the table in and out, in and out, in and out, and see kind of what, what is happening, okay? So we might expect it to have kind of like a hump and then another hump and another hump as we kind of go periodically and move that table. Now another option, it would be that, you know, your coils actually are located on the other side of the peak and then they're going from this point to the right and then back and so now you can see an inverted signal, okay? So that's another possibility. Now, what else could happen is that you can go now and cross the peak and then come back, and so you see kind of like this double kind of camelback type of a response. Or you can even go and see, you know, you go through a few of them depending on how much you move or how fast these, uh, these uh, nulls and peaks are changing, you can get something like that. That will be periodic. So we did this experiment, and we did this experiment with uh, two frequencies, 900 megahertz and 1927. So this is a third order intermodulation. And these are 16 channels that are being, sorry, 22 channels that are being received. And these are the signals, okay? So we're kind of moving that head, you know, this array inside the bore, you know, up and down, up and down, up and down, and kind of seeing the response. Uh, let me point out, this is the positive one. This is the inverted one. That's a different coil and it sees a slightly different response. And this is kind of the camelback one. So yeah, I, you know, these, these nulls and troughs are actually appearing inside. It's not just in simulation. It, you know, there's another kind of proof or evidence that this is things that are happening over there. And each coil will have a slightly different response depending where they are, uh, which is also extremely useful from an information point of view. Now what's really exciting is what's going on with cardiac. Okay, so here's, here's a situation where uh, we measure cardiac with EKG. This is an EKG signal. PPG is on your finger. It's just optical. So it sees changes in, uh, you know, color of your finger. So oxygenated blood, you know, uh, is being modulated. And this is a pilot tone. Uh, basically, this is the beat, uh, beat pilot tone. And you see that at low frequencies, the sensitivity to cardiac is kind of kind of very smooth. It's affected by the fact that the blood is kind of like emptied from the heart and then goes back, and so it's mostly a loading effect, changes of impedance. Now what happens when you actually reach those frequencies where you have standing waves, and also penetrate less the body, well now, the big pilot tone signal becomes more peaky and spiky. So what the heck is going on there? Why is it doing this? And so we're just baffled by this response, like what, what's going on here? Well, okay, so, at really high frequency, like 2.4 gigahertz, body penetration diminishes, right? With increasing frequencies, you're really most sensitive to the surface. And so there's also more field variation, so the signal is changing more rapidly as motion. So you might be actually very sensitive to very small motion. So here's the ECG signal, this is beat pilot tone, they kind of look similar, and you go like, whoa, what's going on? Well, what we're thinking is maybe we're actually sensing what's called a ballistocardiogram. Now what's a ballistocardiogram? Well, Ballistic cardiogram is your, the, turns out when your heart beats, it spits out blood. So the, it's a lot of blood. And so it's just like, think about holding a hose, right? What happens when you hold a hose and you, you, know, you put your, you kind of, your body goes backwards. So the entire body recoils downwards. The blood goes into the aorta, changes direction, so your body recoils the other way, and it pretty much vibrates. If you sit down now, right now here and kind of lie back, and watch your chest, you kinda, you'll see actually how your chest is sli slightly vibrating because of the ballistic cardiogram effect. Now this is, uh, this is something that's actually quite well known. So here's, here's a BCG from a paper, and this is our BPT, and it kinda, oh, well, kinda looks similar. So we wanted to verify that this is actually what's going on. Okay, so BCG was discovered in the late 19th century. Uh, it's measurement of body motion from injection of blood. Uh, so there's different ways to measure, either through displacement, you know, with lasers or optically or velocity or accelerometers. So you can measure all sorts of ways uh, and each one of them is just the derivative of the other. Okay, so this is EKG and this is BCG and those are kind of unknown waves, H, J, K, representing where the blood goes through uh, your body. So here's the setup in order to verify that this is uh, 
I have to say, this is a, you know, this is a remarkable thing for SUMA to actually being able to conduct that experiment. It's not easy to do things in, in an MRI, but the idea is you put a subject with uh, the receiver coils, uh, you put the uh, BPT transmitter up on the bore, you put an acceler accelerometer inside an MRI. This is the accelerometer setup, and these are the coils on top of the subject. And then you put them inside and try to measure both uh, EKG, ECG, BPT, and PT, everything together and see what happens. Okay, so let's see what happens. Wait, this, you can stick electronics in the MRI? Yeah, you can, uh, but the, in this case, we didn't really use imaging. We just received the signal being because we didn't really care about the images as that. But that's not a trivial thing because stuff getting beaded completely inside an MRI. Uh, so this is ECG. This is PPG on your finger. And this is the uh, ballistocardiogram in the Y direction uh, that is displacement. So we integrated twice from accelerometer, so now it's displacement, and that's how it looks like. And this is a BPT from coil 8 that is really close to the heart uh, that you see the signal coming out of, and they look similar, and the timing is on. That's pretty fascinating. Now, if you look at also the pilot tone, which is 127 megahertz, that is kind of smooth, right? Because it's a different effect. It's not affected by the surface, it's affected by actually the draw on the blood, so it takes blood time to get out of the heart, so that's why it's so smooth. Uh, this is vibration on the chest, so that's why it's so sharp. So that's pretty exciting. So what SUMA also did is kind of did a least square regression, taking all those coil signal and try to fit. How, how does it fit well to a, a ballisticardiogram uh, signal? And you can see that with it's about 0.85, uh, correlation, you can actually produce from the beat pilot tone, you know, something that looks like a BCG exactly. And so this is a, this is measured with accelerometer, this is with pilot tone after fitting, and you can see all those nice waves that, you know, again, uh, that shows this, this response. That is super exciting. We're like thrilled to see that. Okay, what else? What else you can do? Well, we can Move down in frequency, move down in frequency, you get different wavelengths that actually penetrate the body more. So 900 megahertz, you got a little bit more, about 10, 15 centimeter penetration inside the body. We put the antenna really, uh, the transmitter really close now to the body. And this is a fast imaging at about one second frame rate of peristalsis. So this is a bowel, you kind of see how the bowel is moving. Uh, this is the bowel, it's kind of the peristalsis motion of the bowel. And then you can see gas, of course, because we're moving gas. Uh, you can also see the, the arteries, and those are aliased. They're actually beating at a much faster rate. We're just not sampling it fast enough. Um, and then this is the 900 megahertz beat pilot tone that is 256 times faster than this imaging frame rate. Because again, like for, we need about 256 lines of frequency or domain in order to produce an image. These are responses of 16 coils. Definitely you see cardiac, right? Because the aorta, you know, all the, uh, the iliac arteries actually was, was there, and so you could see actually them beating, right? So those are modulating some signal. Now, this was a breath-held acquisition. You know, you just hold breath for an, a minute and a half. Okay, challenging. Um, but there's all this modulation. Why is there modulation if somebody's holding the breath? Well, if you actually look at the rate, it's kind of similar to the amount of, you know, the, the, actually the peristalsis motion inside, inside the body. And if you actually look at a cross section over here, it's close to the coils, and this is uh, kind of how it do. And I overlaid one of the coil responses. Eh, <laughs> kind of matches, right? Like there's definitely an area where it's really periodic, and then maybe it moves a little bit differently. And so, you know, this is a contribution from a lot of sources, so it needs to be decoupled. Right now, I'm just showing kind of this combination of a lot of stuff, but. Obviously, something is going on that's pretty correlated, and we definitely think that this is related to peristalsis. So the question is, can you actually image peristalsis using a spread? Maybe. It's hard to say. What about head motion? Here's an experiment. You put a person inside, and uh, you have, now we put two antennas, one in the top, one on the side, and we tell the subject to kind of move their head like in a yes, and we tell them to move in a no, and we measure both the signals from these two, each one of them correspond to a different one. That's a 2.4 gigahertz. And uh, this antenna correspond to these lines, and this antenna correspond to these lines. And so we can just place a lot of those, right? Like, and there's a lot of room, actually, to put even more if we wanted to. 
These are the responses to the uh, yes from all these 22 channel coils. These are the responses from the no from all these 22 coils. And you can see that they're different. Different coils behave at different pl you know, places. So there's a lot of information there that can be ex extracted about where actually the head is in three dimension. And this is only 2D imaging over time. What we really want to do is 3D imaging, but then we can't really get that temporal resolution. It will take you know, 10 minutes acquisition, and it's not possible. Here it's a very fast acquisition. You can get one second frame rate. But if you want to do 3D, it will take you one minute. Almost done. OK, so you take all these coils. You take all these coils, and, um, and you compute principal components out of them. And uh, these are the three principal components uh, that were computed from all these coils. And this is for the uh, shake no part. And this is for the nod yes part. And what you do is you try to plot these three PCs, um, you know, trajectories, those trajectories on the uh, three-dimensional principal component space. Okay. And you can see, oh, wow, the yes and the no obviously are very separated because their signal is so different. Also, you see a very smooth trajectory from here, sorry, from here all the way there, and then from here all the way there, you know, the yes and no. So you could potentially use that in order to correct. If you had a nonlinear regression method, you possibly can correct for at least rigid motion of the head through some learning that you can apply. So that was very exciting. So we had uh, Nick. Uh, we call him Tiny Nick, but he's actually quite tall. Uh, that came to visit us uh, over the summer. And um, Nick actually looked at this idea of using an nonlinear regression, uh, using a Gaussian process, in order to be able to correct for translation rotation motion inside an MRI scanner by using this beat pilotone idea. And the idea is was you, you go and collect. Now, I'm showing here something that you haven't seen before. Um, turns out the MRI, you don't have to actually collect data sequentially in a two-dimensional Fourier transform. You can actually collect it as radial lines in a three-dimensional Fourier transform. Again, not, don't want to go in specific, but you can actually do this. So you get very quickly the low resolution information uh, very, very fast. If you wanted to acquire high resolution, then you have to go further out in the frequency domain, and that takes more time. So we can do a low resolution reconstruction at the same time collect the beat pilot tone. We, from the low resolution, it's enough to register rotation translation. And then we try to do some nonlinear regression using a Gaussian process uh, in order to find pretty much what are the coefficient in order to then combine this beat pilot tone in or into translation rotation uh, variables. Now we can go and collect a higher resolution acquisition at the same time while collecting this beat pilot tone. From uh, the beat pilot tone, we use the coefficient that we got from the uh, training period in order to estimate rotation and translation. And then we use that to correct this high frequency data. Okay? And we don't have images here yet. We, but we collect, correct the data. And then after being corrected for translation and rotation, in the Fourier it's actually quite easy. Translation is just a linear phase. Rotation is a, is a rotation. So you could do that pretty easily in this particular case. And so, and then provide a reconstruction. So what's the outcome? Well, here's an acquisition where we actually collected data for a very long time with no motion. And this is the image that is reconstructed from the no motion part. Okay. Um, then this is a period of time where we collect the data while there is motion. So again, this is kind of the data acquisition while there is motion. And this is just uncorrected. You get blurring, you get streaking artifacts because of the type of acquisition. Things are become blurred. But once you use this BPT signal that was trained using, uh, uh, using a training period and correct for translation rotation, now you, got, you can now start seeing the structure behind. So now you actually can see a brain that's not blurred and hazy. Um, it's not as perfect as this. Uh, but it's much, much, much nicer. This is diagnostic. This is non-diagnostic. Okay? So that's very exciting. Um, and so the idea here that we can leverage actually this B-pilotone that has quite a lot of information in order to correct for rotation translation. 
which is exciting. OK, how do, but, okay, how do we take it further? Well, here's kind of a vision. Okay? We haven't done this, but this is kind of what we want. And this is what I thought would be interesting to present here because there's so many things that can be done with this type of new modality. And the new modality is really using RF inside a bore, which is pretty much a cavity that creates resonant modes of standing waves. This is different than transmitting RF outside. It's not the same. If you put yourself inside this tube and transmit RF, your body will interact very differently or the response will be very different than in space that, that we are in this room. Okay? Because of those uh, resonant mode that happen and all of the standing waves that are being modulated, so even small stuff that might move inside your body may modulate stuff outside that we'll be able to pick. Okay? So the idea was to put a lot of these antennas, transmitting antennas, inside the bore. They don't take space. You just need a little bit of wires. You stick them to the bore, and then you just can transmit actually multiple frequencies from each one of those antennas. So multiple BPT at different frequencies from different positions. Okay? Uh, if this is the MRI bandwidth, we make sure that those BPTs are outside. So we can have, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, 256, I don't know how many we can put inside. And now you've got yourself 64 receivers, 32 transmitters. Think of the, how many time signals of all those cross products that you could actually be able to sense at different frequencies. That's a lot of information. Now, the thing is, this is quite chaotic in the sense that it's very sensitive to boundary condition, different things, where things are positioned, what's the orientation of the coils. So actually creating a model of doing this without knowing where things are is extremely difficult. But you've got some MR images that you can collect, and you can maybe use some of that to train some non-rigid 3D model, maybe, of the motion. Maybe. I mean, I think there's a lot of things that you can do there, because you can collect data in MRI in two dimension that is dynamic. You can move it around. You can low resolution 3D. There's a lot of options there. You can add a camera. You can do a lot of things. And once you have a trained model that's nonlinear, maybe you can then create an imager, imager that senses motion inside the body. So with that, hopefully uh, I want to give a shout out for Sumo who's going to present uh, some of the work today. Also uh, Shreya and Alfredo that are also going to talk about MRI, even though this is not a con uh, an MRI, but there's a lot of stuff that's worth listening. So you know, watch their posters as well. And with that, I'm just going to say thank you to my group. And uh, got NIH funding and also a lot of help from uh, GA Healthcare. And thank you so much. Very nice talk.